where they're depicted as proud and grim, that is, and cruel and of wicked cheer, persecuting St. Stephen and driving Christ's apostles out of the Holy Land. The poem thus neatly removes Jews from the time of Jesus' life. This is 13 years later. It also, interestingly, reverses the typical Christian emphasis on Jewish exile and dispersion as punishment for the crucifixion, a reversal that we might read in part as a return of the repressed, since the early Christians who have so far in the poem been buffered from any Jewish connections, thus in their own exile and dispersion, take up the position generally associated with Jews. In any case, here, the post-crucifixion Jews are depicted as still politically powerful, a position they also occupy when the exiled Mary Magdalene and her companions arrive in southern France at Marseille, where they're greeted with hostility by the resident Jews and Saracens. I turn now, so that's the always already, and we can talk more about that um, aspect of, of medieval representations of, of the origins of Christianity and the ways in which conversion is um, at the origin of the religion. I turn now to the poem's second temporal mode, the yet and yet and yet, where we see the poem's central figure, Mary, herself undergoing conversion over and over again. This already occurs in the poem's opening movement, where Mary's conversion, this moral conversion that she undergoes, is enacted in several stages, each of which might itself be defined as the moment of conversion. Thus, Mary, hearing that her bad behavior has led her to lose her name, her reputation, first feels woe and shame and withdraws from the rich man with whom she has had sex and from the world altogether. But that's not the only conversion. Next, she endures moral chiding from her sister, Martha. And when Jesus arrives at Simon Leper's house, Mary, still consistently described as sinful despite her retreat from the world, prepares, this is familiar, an ointment for Jesus and kisses and washes his feet, anointing his head. Actions that Jesus, of course, praises over Judas's and Simon's objections. Jesus then makes explicit Mary's renewed moral state. He says, up arise, thou woman, your sins are forgiven you, um, as I can now do and am able to do, I shrive you, I absolve you. Still, Jesus must drive seven devils out of Mary before she can become his procurator, his dear one, and his hostess, and begin her missionary activity. Any or all of these sequential movements can be conceived as conversionary, and we begin to see that while conversion might have already occurred with any of them, it must also recur. The poem continues after Mary's arrival in Europe to depict the convert's life as the life of conversion, a status that is perhaps well described in, by Leotard's formulation of the convert as bearing a fissure within. As soon as Mary and her companions arrive in Marseille, they shrive each other, thus confirming their religious status. Mary continues her mission among the land's initially non-receptive Saracens and Jews, and for some time the poem focuses on her making of converts rather than her own conversionary movements. But when her mission is accomplished, Mary re-embraces the movement of conversion for herself, stealing away from her kin into the wilderness where she dwells for 30 years. With no food or drink, and this is the Mary of Egypt story, but in the Middle Ages it gets um, incorporated into the legend of Mary Magdalene. With no food or drink, Mary miraculously survives, and her life in the desert consists of a single repeated action. Angels came every day, bore her up into the sky, and then brought her back to earth. People cannot imagine how she lives, for no one ever saw her eat, but some understood or believed that she lived by angelina meat, um, angelic food. This repeated action replays the effects of Mary's conversion over and over again. Her salvation has been achieved, 
She lives by angelic food, and still it has not yet been achieved and must be reenacted daily. When Mary summarizes her life as her death approaches, she presents it as an uninterrupted series of conversions from the moment she first shrove herself to the king of heaven to her current life of being born daily to heaven's sky by God's angels. The movements associated with her death similarly replay conversion. She has a priest announce her imminent return from the desert to Marseille, and she arrives there born by angels. She's shriven one last time, receiving the sacrament, weeping with good devotion, and giving her life and spirit into Jesus' hands. At last, she is led without strife immediately to paradise, finally completing the angelic movement that she's experienced daily for the past 30 years. Only here is Mary's position as Christian and saint fully achieved. Her life up until this point is characterized by a series of conversion experiences, so that we might think of the temporality of her life in terms of constant transition rather than achievement of any fixed final position. This yet and yet and yet seems a temporality opposed to that of the all, always already. And yet, the two are paradoxically merged in a third movement of time that com combines proleptic achievement with constant deferral, a temporal mode that here, using a phrase from Giorgio Agamben's The Time That Remains, I refer to as the already, not yet. This is the temporality of the poem's central and strangest episode, which depicts Mary Magdalene's successful activity as a missionary in southern France. Through her negotiations with the Prince of Marseille and his wife, which ultimately lead to a point where all that land was Christian. This occurs, however, in the most indirect, roundabout, deferred, and illogical way possible. Following, I'm going to have to summarize the plot to try to persuade you that that's true, um, but I think maybe I, I'll succeed. Um, following a route that allows for the elaboration of a complex narrative, but a narrative that leads finally nowhere new, either spatially or temporally. Conversion here is a standing still or remaining in place that occurs paradoxically through a massive movement of both geographical displacement and temporal dilation. So the complicated story, as shortly as I possibly can recount it, is this. Mary and her companions, arriving in Marseille, receive a cold welcome from the native Saracens and Jews. The prince of the Saracens is particularly hostile, and Mary appears three times in night visions to his wife, predicting sorrow and political defeat if her people do not lend the Christians support. Each time, the wife neglects to report her dream to her husband. And on the fourth night, Mary appears to the prince himself with a similar, if increasingly threatening, message. Here, the poem has an odd moment of inconsequentiality. After awakening this fourth night, the prince's wife finally tells him of her three previous visions at a moment when it's kind of too late to matter. Frightened, the prince agrees to provide aid to Mary's people and is further swayed toward conversion by Mary's preaching. He asks, however, for proof of Christian truth and particularly for the gift of a son for which Mary immediately prays. That night, the prince's wife becomes pregnant through God's grace and the prince responds by promising to go on pilgrimage to Rome to speak there with St. Peter and to receive baptism from him. A wrinkle is introduced here when, over the prince's objection, his pregnant wife insists on accompanying him to Rome to be christened. The two receive a blessing from Mary Magdalene, but their voyage is ill-fated. Seven nights into the trip, a storm strikes, at which point the queen goes into labor, bearing a son as promised, but herself dying in childbirth. The ship men want to throw the queen's body into the sea to save the ship, and it's only with difficulty that the prince persuades them to leave her body, along with the newborn son, on an island. Arriving in Rome, the prince finds St. Peter and tells him his story. The saint comforts him by suggesting that God has the power to exchange bliss for sorrow, 